His flower, like the precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of his love. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. And for the next few minutes, I want to talk about one of the beautiful facets of Islam. This one is called complete. Complete. Islam is complete. One of the meanings in the word itself implies a wholeness or a completeness. Allah, God Almighty. In his revelation, the speech of Allah in the Quran, he says something amazing to us. We find it in chapter 5, Al-Mayada, when he says, On this day have I perfected for you your way of life and completed my favor on you and have chosen for you to submit to me in Al-Islam. And Al-Islam means surrender, submission, doing what God wants you to do in sincerity and in peace. So this is what he's saying to us. And this was one of the very last of all revelation to come. The Quran itself is the last revelation to human being. And it's a preserved revelation, as we've discovered in some of our other programs on facets of Islam. Here now, though, is one of the last pieces of the last revelation coming to us. And God is saying this statement, perfected deen, perfected way of life. On this day, have I perfected for you your way of life and completed my nitmati. Nitma. Na'ma. Na'ma means big favor. Naim is the name of one of the levels of paradise, a big favor of Allah, genital Naim. So when Allah says this, that he is giving you nitmati, and that's possessive of the word, my favor, Allah's favor. Now stop and think who's talking to you here. This is the creator. This is our provider. This is the originator of the universe. This is the only one with any power or any ability, and he's saying that he is completing something for you, and that's his favor. He's completed a favor and chosen for us to do this. Do what? His will. His will here on earth, just as his will is being done in heaven. Now, this was mentioned by prophets before. Even today, in what remains of the translation of the Bible, we find that they say Jesus said these same words. That when you pray, pray and ask God like this. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? And when you consider this completeness, this wholeness, you begin to ask yourself, well, was it always available before? Or is it only since the time of Muhammad? Very interesting question. Stop and think back now and realize that each of the nations and tribes and peoples as they came and populated the earth and they moved from here to there and they constructed things that were later demolished, things that fell apart later, civilizations built up and torn down, all of these things happening, did they get completeness of deen? The answer is in the Quran itself. Allah tells us that he never... Never did he ever punish any people or destroy any people until after he sent a messenger to them. Each of the messengers that came before Muhammad, peace be upon him, came exclusively to their own people, in their own language, in their own culture, and with their own traditions so that they could understand what it was that they needed to do. For the children of Israel, they were favored above all of the other people. Allah said it in the Quran. He favored them so much above all the people and gave them a gift, a big gift, a big favor. And it was called Hidayah, guidance, Hidayah. Yet what happened when they rejected this gift, when they rejected and turned away from this guidance and how Allah punished them? And it's mentioned in their own book clearly 
how they suffered every time they worshipped other than the one God. The false worship and the statues and the things that they brought. Obviously, this was not something pure, complete, but something added. Now this brings us to another aspect. Another aspect of this facet. The completeness versus the incompleteness. Because Allah has given a complete way of life. A deen. Something that applies from the time you're born until the time you die. And it's in your life from the time you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night. It's all inclusive. And when it comes with Muhammad, peace be upon him, it came as a complete, totally, totally fulfilled way of life. This completeness of deen. That when a person gets up in the morning, he knows what to say. He wakes up thanking Allah, the one who causes us to die and be born again. The one who let me sleep and woke me up. He knows when he puts his clothes on what to say. And thanks Allah for what he has. And at the same time, ask Allah, don't make me so proud to go around and be vain. Huh? And when he eats, he knows what to say. Thanking Allah for the food. When he's finished, he knows what to say. As he goes out of his house, when he returns back, he knows what to say. He knows how to praise his Lord. It's not just the words. It's the knowing of what to think and how to appreciate. When I leave my house, I leave it in the trust of Allah. And I ask him to care for it. When I get into the vehicle and I ask him to bless our trip. Or I say to him that I acknowledge that he's the one really that gave us the control over the vehicle. Which we wouldn't have had unless he gave it to us to start with. I know these things because Islam now is complete and it's a total way of life. So if anybody tries to innovate and bring something into it, it's not going to be complete from Allah anymore. It won't be. After people in, innovated and they invented things that didn't belong in the religion, it became necessary again to send prophets to bring the people back to the right way. I'll give you an example of that. It was said at the time of Noah, salam, that's the prophet Noah, the one with the ark and the animals, that that was the first time people began to worship statues, idols. And that false worship that they had for these idols and statues took them away from the right belief and the right worship of the one God. This is something that needs to have a prophet come back and call them back to the right way to get rid of this innovation, this bid'ah that they have. They need to know that this is wrong. It's not acceptable. The calling away from this is not an easy thing because once people start doing something, it's hard to get them to stop. Whether it's cigarette smoking, alcohol, drugs, any of the bad things that people do, once they start, it becomes difficult to get them away from it. And the same for the false worship. The meaning here is that the worst of all actions are the innovations into the deen or religion of Islam. Those new things that somebody made up. And that all of these new innovations are a misguiding. And that all of the misguidings are going to go into the fire of hell. And this is plus or minus the meaning of what he said. We understand immediately the danger now of what's called bid'a. And bid'a is something so bad that it's considered the thing that will take people out of Islam the fastest. And it's also one of the very first things that comes up in incorrect worship. Now, I want to think about this. I want to take a break. I want to come back and talk more about this subject of completeness versus the bid'ah. So stay right there. We're going to be right back. You're watching Facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We're back. We've been talking about the subject of completeness in Islam, the complete way of life. We've also have been talking about a subject called bid'a. The bid'a, which we said is an innovation, something new, something that wasn't there originally. And many of the bid'a actually are nice things that we have every day in the life, in what we call hayat dunya, the life of this world. 
some nice bidah. I love my microwave oven. I get instant coffee like this. That's a bidah, a very nice bidah. I also like my computer. People didn't used to have computers, and now we do. Television, there's a bidah, nice. Well, <laughs> if it weren't for TV, you wouldn't be watching this, would you? <laughs> so we have these bidah, which are innovations, which are good, which we use and help. Technology provide us with a lot of good information and help our lives to be easy. All of these are considered good bid'ah. But in the matters of the religion, in the belief, in the worship of Allah, this is totally unacceptable. There can only be one true religion, and it cannot be interpreted by one human being, or it cannot be invented by one human being, and then everybody just follow that and consider this is the right way. In fact, the religion has to come from the Lord himself. Many people claim to represent various religions, whether it's Islam or Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism. But do they really? Because if what they're representing is exactly what came from the Lord in the beginning, then perhaps they're telling you the truth. But if it's something new that wasn't there before, you should question it. Where did they get this from? Who really came up with this idea? Why did they say this? Was there money involved? Was there some power involved, wealth involved? What was it that gave them the incentive to become innovative and make up this thing? Regardless of their motivation, we still realize that it's wrong. The worship for the Creator must be on His terms. From the very beginning, let us consider, Adam, the first man, was instructed one thing, don't eat the fruit. All the religions of monotheism agree that that was the first of all the commandments, don't eat the fruit. In Islam, we also know that the devil was commanded to do something. Whereas Adam was commanded, don't do something, the devil was commanded, do something. At the point of creation of Adam, Allah ordered all creation, bow down. And all creation bowed down. Allah said, illa iblis, except for Lucifer, except for the devil himself. He refused to bow down because of his arrogance, his kibber, his pride. No, I'm not going to bow down. He refused. And this is how he became rejected. Although he had been close to Allah at one point, trying to worship Allah, even elevated up with angels, now he fell down out of this high status because he refused to obey. He was commanded, do something. And he didn't do it. He refused. Adam, on the other hand, was ordered not to do something, but he did it. This is the correct understanding now, the balance here that we're talking about. And now let us look to how this is affected by bid'ah. Because the devil himself wants to take people to hell with him. Adam, incidentally, repented for what he did. He asked Allah, Allah, forgive me. I'm sorry. And Allah forgave him. And that's beautiful. And that completes his deen. Because he was born, created, lived, made his choices, made a mistake, did the best thing, went back to Allah, asked for forgiveness, Completeness. That's how it works. The devil, on the other hand, refuses. He will not bow down. He's still to this day, he's not going to bow down. He has committed himself to the proposition that he is going to take Adam and all of his children to hell with him. That's his stance. That's his attitude. That's his position. This is what he wants. So one of the ways to do that is to get the people to do a big mistake, and that is to worship other than Allah. Let us look to the Quran and consider the statement that Allah says. Clearly, Allah says he does not ever forgive people who set up worship with other gods beside him. But anything else, less than this, he can forgive it. So if the devil can achieve this, get people to worship other than Allah, then he feels successful because he knows they'll go to hell with him and they'll stay there. 
And how can he do it? Simply by making some changes in the religion that weren't there. Things that don't belong there. Innovations. Vida. How can we, as Muslims today, know whether or not we're on the right religion? Well, simple. We already know Allah says that he has completed his favor on us. And in the Quran, he's told us, and this is one of the other facets of Islam, that the Quran is preserved and will remain preserved, guarded by Allah. So it's here. We still have it in the Arabic language. Do you want to know what God said? You simply go to the Quran. There it is. It doesn't change. The other thing that we have is something like it. This was mentioned in a hadith of Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Quran and something like it, which is what? His way, his sunnah. And this interprets and helps us to understand. Another facet of Islam, understanding the Quran by his sunnah. So we know it. So it's simple today for us to decide, is this thing that somebody's talking about a part of Islam, the completeness? Is this a part of the favor that Allah gave us? Is it? All we have to do is compare it. Compare it to the Furqan, the benchmark. Another facet of Islam that we'll be talking about is this benchmark. Compare it to the Quran. Is this thing the person's talking about found in the Quran? No. Do we find it anywhere from the teaching of Muhammad in his sunnah, in his hadith? Do we find it? No. Could be bid'ah. It's important now to go to our scholars and ask them, where did this come from? Where did this come from? And if it's from Allah, through his Quran or his messenger, alhamdulillah, praise to Allah, we accept it and we do it. But if we can't find it there, why are we doing it? Where did it come from? When you see people that have these little amulets, their little things that they carry around, their good luck charms or their little beads in their hands or the things that they've got, what connotation are they offering along with that? Is this some kind of good luck charm? Is this something that if I wear it, it's going to cure me of something? Are these physical things a part of Islam? And the answer is, of course, no, they're not. And what about these actions that some people do? They're doing this or doing that. Is that really a part of Islam? Check it out. In fact, some things that people claim to be a part of Islam today are against it. But the beautiful thing is the completeness of this deen is still there. And you can find for yourself. It's simple. Go to the Quran in the Arabic language and understand what it says. And then read from what Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, what he did, what he taught, and then you'll be able to better understand this completeness. Bida is a subject so big that we have volumes all about it. The big scholars of Islam have lectured on it, written about it, and told us so many things about the dangers of this disease called bid'a. It's something that we should avoid at all costs. But it's not wrong to read about it, to learn about it. In fact, it's good for you to get more knowledge about these things and to learn how these things come about and how to avoid it. Consider this. The devil, who's trying to take everybody to hell, is not going to come to a religious person and offer him a drink of alcohol. That's just not going to work. If, if, just stop and think. He would walk up to somebody who's very religious, very good, very pious, and say, why don't you do a bad deed? You know, why don't you steal something? He's not going to do it. No, in fact, he'll go the other way. He'll get him to become extreme first in the religion. Oh, yeah. And that's how it started with Adam. When we were talking about the time of Adam and how things then were pure, it was complete. But then his generations after him, and there were some who came, they were very religious, very pious, very close to the right way. So much so that when they died, people made statues, effigies, images, idols, and called them by the name of that person. They said, you know, this represents so-and-so. And then the next generation said the same, yeah, this is old so-and-so and such-and-such and, -such and this one. But then the next generation began to actually pray to those statues. Well, they started out actually praying to Allah, remembering those people. Then some people started to pray to the people. Although they were dead, they want to pray to them. Then somebody praying to the statue and it gets worse. It comes in stages, one by one by one, slowly. 
Shaitan, the devil, he knows how to get people to exaggerate. Another thing is if somebody comes into Islam and they're new to Islam, to get them to do things that are really uh, way beyond what they've been asked to do. Instead of just praying the simple five times a day, they try to do all the extra prayers, the night prayers, the morning prayers, the middle of the afternoon prayers, and standing and praying and praying and standing. And then fasting comes along. Oh, I want to fast more. I'm going to fast every day. And somebody else says, you know, I'm going to spend all my time in worship. I'm never going to get married. Well, this happened exactly at the time of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. Some people, three people, came into Islam at the time of Muhammad, and they said to his wife that one of them, he said, I'm going to pray day and night. I'm not going to stop. The other one said, I want to fast every day. I'm not going to eat or drink during the daytime. And the other one said, and I'm never going to get married. So when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came back, she told him what these men had said. And he became angry. He said, am I not better at doing this deen, this way, this complete way? Am I not? He said, yet, I pray, but I sleep in the night. Because the other man said he wasn't going to sleep. He just going to stay up and pray. He said, I fast, but I eat. So it means he alternates some days. Some days he's eating and uh, drinking, but other days, no, he doesn't. He said, and I get married. I have wives. So you see this? This is the completeness, the balance. Another facet, by the way, of Islam is balance. When somebody becomes extreme like this, then they have opened the door to go out of Islam, even though they think they're in it. Look at the condition we're in now, and you can understand why sometimes we hear people talk about Islam, but it doesn't really appear to be Islam. What is the completeness of the religion of Islam? The completeness of the religion of Islam is to know there's only one God. He's the only one to worship, the only one to be grateful to, the only one to say thank you to. And that uh, Muhammad is his messenger, and he is the benchmark for us. He's the one for us to look to, to see how to implement and practice our deen, our religion. And there's only one final revelation, the Quran. Although other books partially exist, but the Quran is total and complete. And so Islam is the same, complete. And Allah said, Al yawmul atmautu lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alikum nimati wa raditulukum Islam and dina. Islam, like the precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. In this episode, I'd like to discuss the word just. Just as in justice just as in fair, just as in being perfectly balanced, just as in giving fair measure, proper reward or punishment, real justice. Islam insists on things being fair and balanced. One of the things that we should keep in mind is that Allah, the Creator, is just. And he is the epitome of this word, adil, adil. And he is most just, most fair in everything. Everything that he creates has a balance to it, a beautiful balance. It's never going to be tipped one way or the other, except when the human tries to play with it. And of course, <laughs> that will backfire on them. Let me begin by mentioning that when Allah tells us in the Quran how to deal with people, He tells us, don't let your hatred for a people cause you to deal unjustly with them. 
An example of this came from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when it was his responsibility to give a verdict in a particular case. And the people really were not treating the Muslims well, they were not treating him well, but yet he dealt with justice in what he was doing. There was an occasion when the tribes in the Quraysh time, Mecca, had rebuilt part of the Kaaba, and they took the stone, the black stone, which they were cleaning, preparing, reconstructing, doing some renovation. Then it came time to put the stone back. The problem came now that each member of the tribe was saying, I want to put it back. So this tribe is saying, no, we're going to put it back. And this tribe says, no, we want to be the one to put it in there. And it got a little bit serious. In fact, they almost went to blows because of this honor of putting the stone back, which is a nice thing. They were going to do something really bad, and they were going to start killing each other. But then it was decided. But how will we handle the problem? Because everybody wants to be the tribe to put it back, put the stone in its place. It was decided that, all right, whoever comes in the gate, the next one through the door to the sanctuary, we'll let them decide. Of course, right away, I'm sure each of the tribe members was thinking, I hope it's somebody from my tribe. I hope it's somebody from our tribe, because then we'll be the ones to put it back. And who came through the door? None other than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And when he came through the door, they all became happy. He was only from one tribe. Why would all the other tribes be happy? Because he had this quality of being just, of being fair, being trustworthy, and being honest. So they felt that, well, if we're going to get a fair shot, it's going to come from him. So they explained to him the dilemma, the problem that they had. Who shall put this stone back in its place, they wanted to know. How about our tribe? What about our tribe? What about us? And look at the wisdom that comes with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And by the way, don't forget, he could have said, well, my tribe, because, you know, we're the oldest tribe, or my grandfather was the big leader, and so and so. He could have said all of those things. And he could have given a lot of good reasons why it should only be his tribe, or Beni Hashem, perhaps, that should do it. But he didn't. Instead, he said, why not take a sheet or a large cloth and then put the stone in this cloth. Then a member of each tribe take part of this cloth and lift it up. So all of you together are lifting it up, taking it to its place, and then I'll push it into its place. And he did. Exactly that's how it was done. Imagine this. Now that's dealing really fair. Another lesson that we have, and we learn this from the Quran, is the fairness of all the prophets, especially when they were called upon to judge. In one instance, we have the story of the woman who came forward complaining that this other woman had taken her baby. They brought the other woman, and they want to know what's going on. And they asked the Prophet Suleiman about judgment on this. The one lady said, well, her baby died, and she took my baby in the night. The other lady said, no, 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 this is my baby, your baby died. Both of them arguing about this subject. Whose baby is it? And the Prophet said to them, why don't we do this? We'll be fair. Bring a sword, and we'll cut the baby in half. We'll give the half to the one lady and half to the other lady. Each of you will have an equal amount. The lady holding the baby said, okay, that's fair. Yeah, do that. The other lady said, no, 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 no. Let her keep it. Let her keep it. It's okay. It's her baby. The prophet then understood, and he said, this lady is the real mother. This lady. The one who said, let her keep it. Because he knew no mother would ever agree to having their child cut like this. The other lady, on the other hand, it really happened that her baby did die. And in her distress, in her mind, she had stolen this other baby. And her mind wasn't clear anymore, obviously. 
because otherwise how could she agree to allow somebody to cut her baby in half? It wasn't her baby. And so this is a lesson that we get right away about justice, true justice. Islam insists on things being fair. Another thing that's very important amongst Muslims is to deal in business in a fair and just manner. That when you give measure, you have to give full measure. And when you receive, you have to be careful not to take more than is due to you. Now that's simple to say it, but in real life what happens, and a lot of people don't practice it. Even though they claim to be Muslims, they claim to be a good person, but still when it comes to business, and you see somebody taking a little extra, but not giving full measure, then you know they have not fulfilled their Islam. They're not really dealing in justice. Allah warns them about that. He curses them in the Quran because they want full measure for themselves, but they don't give this justice to others whenever they do business with them. Also, even small things. I've watched Muslims, and it really impresses me when I see Muslims do this. And I'm not saying other people don't do it too. In fact, it's a good sign from anybody of any religion when they deal justly. It's very good. In fact, this could be a way that Allah will guide them because of their good, just heart they have. But I remember one time when my own mother, many years ago, was driving. We were traveling on a long trip, and she stopped the car, and she said, Oh, my God. We said, What's the matter? She said, When we were at the restaurant, I didn't pay for something that I bought over there. I got it, and I left. I didn't pay for it. And she turned around and drove over a hundred miles back just to give them a few coins for that thing that she had bought and not paid for. And the people were amazed and they said, how? How is it you did that? You came all this way, but just for this. She said, no, because you have to deal in justice. Now, keep in mind, my mother wasn't a Muslim, but she was doing the justice which comes in the monotheistic religions. So... If anybody deals with justice, it is good for them and good for all of us. Now, I want you to think about this. We're going to take a break. We're going to come right back right after this and have more of the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We're back and we're talking about the subject of just as in justice and justness. We've been talking about how Islam is ordering for us to deal fair, especially in business. I've given you a couple of examples of incidences that have taken place. And I've seen it from Muslims as well. In fact, it's one of the things that really attracted me to Islam is dealing with a man in business. Because you see, when I came to Islam, I really wasn't looking for a new religion. In fact, I was trying to convert people to go to Christianity. The man that I was trying to convert was a Muslim from Egypt. We were doing business together. And I considered myself a pretty fair businessman, just, in my own opinion. But this man did some things that disturbed me. I'll give you an example. We had a table that had some sale items on it. And when people come up, they pay a small amount and take their items and go. But I saw that he was reaching into a box and giving the people things out of a box rather than taking them off the table. So I asked him, why are you doing this? He said, well, the things on the table have an expiration date that is much sooner than the ones in the box. So I'm giving them the ones from the box. I said, but didn't you understand the reason we put those on the table for the low price is because of the expiration date? Don't you know that as soon as those are gone, we're going to raise the price back up and then we'll put these out there? He said to me, in my religion, I can't do that. I said, what? He said, listen, if you want to run a sale, this is one subject. But if you're going to do that, then you need to inform them about this date that that's the reason. You can't just put it up there as though it's the same product that you have in the box. I said, they don't care. He said, I care. 
I was shocked. How is that? Is this Islam? He said, this is Islam. He said, okay, well, then fine. Tell them what you want to say or put them all out there. Who cares? But that small thing had a big impact on me. But when it comes to Allah, now let's talk about Allah. Is Allah fair? Is Allah just? Does Allah deal in fairness with the people? We said Allah is adil, which means he's absolutely just in all things. But watch this. And I think you'll appreciate when you hear how Allah really deals. Islam teaches us that there's an angel records your good deeds and another angel recording the bad deeds. As soon as a person intends to do a good deed, the intention itself is recorded as a good deed. They already have a full good deed just for the intention. And if they do the deed, actually achieve that, do it, accomplish it, then it's recorded for them ten times. Ten times. And Allah says, who brings me a good deed on the day of judgment, they'll find ten Meaning that you have ten times reward for every single good deed. That's good news. That would keep this angel pretty busy if I did a lot of good deeds, recording all of these times ten, wouldn't it? But then look at this. If a person intended to do a bad deed, nothing's recorded. Nothing's recorded if they didn't do it. What if somebody intends to do a bad deed and then they stop themselves and say, no, I shouldn't have done this. I won't do it. I'm not going to do this thing. In this case, they'll be recorded a good deed. Why? Because they stopped a bad deed. That's a good deed. Wow. You mean if somebody was thinking, I'm going to rob a bank. No, that's wrong. I'm not going to do that. They get a good deed? Yes. In Islam, yes. Okay, what if they have the intention for a bad deed, they don't stop themselves, and they do the bad deed? Then what happens? Well, as the angel on this side begins to write down the bad deed, the angel on this side says, wait, don't record it yet. Maybe he will repent. Maybe he will say, astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. So after a little while, this angel starts to write again, and the angel stops him again and says, wait. Maybe he'll say, Astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me. And then after a while, he still doesn't repent. Then the angel will write for him one full bad deed. Of course, by the way, I should mention, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us, follow up a bad deed with a good deed. Always follow up a bad deed with a good deed. And this is also in Islam. But to come back to the facet that we're talking about now, which is being just and fair. Whoever deals with the people in fairness and in justice, whoever is being fair in all aspects, then he will receive justice on the Day of Judgment, without doubt. And Allah loves that. The opposite of justice and fairness is called dhulm. Dhulm, and it means oppression. And there's different kinds of oppression. But Allah says that he forbids himself ever to oppress. He never oppresses. And this would be the opposite of his characteristic, which is adil, just. So Allah can never oppress. And he hates it when we oppress each other. And one of the worst oppressions, really, is when a person oppresses themselves. It was the prophet Jonah, or Eunice, when he was in the he was in the whale down in the bottom of the sea and he realized he had oppressed himself by leaving his people when he was commanded to stay with his people to be with them to give them this message about worshiping one God but he left them he went out to sea he was thrown off the ship the whale swallowed him but look at this inside the whale for those days and nights that he was there he didn't blame God. In fact, he only blamed himself because he realized the justice. The justice is he had done nothing more than earned exactly what he got. So his statement is so beautiful when he says, La ilaha illa ante subhanaka ni kuntum minidala. Mean. 
There is none worthy to worship except you, Allah. All the glory is to you. And verily, I have done wrongdoing to myself. Boom, to myself. At that moment, at that point, that's when Allah caused this whale to take him back up, take him back over, spit him out because he had done the right thing. That was the true justice, to realize that I've done wrong, did it to myself, and the only way to get out of this is to do what? Admit it. Admit my mistake. Dealing with people in justice is something really easy to say. But in fact, it's not that easy, especially when people are not being fair to you. Consider this. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, decided to take the message of worship of one God to the people of a taif, which is not very far, maybe 30 miles or so from Mecca. He went up into the mountains there to speak to the tribal leaders. But they abandoned their own tradition, which is to always receive a guest in the best manner. A guest has three days and nights with the best honor, with food, drink, shelter, anything they need. No questions asked, just come and partake. But they didn't uphold their own tradition. They didn't follow their own custom. Instead, they ignored him. They turned him away. They didn't want to talk to him. They didn't want to hear his message. In fact, they turned the street children, the beggars or the urchins against him, telling them, take rocks and throw on him. And they began to rocks, throw these rocks on him to stone him, to hit him and his companion and chase them out of town. It, it was really bad. So much so that the blood from his body was filling his sandals. And in this condition, the angel Gabriel came to him and told him that Allah has the angels ready to bring the mountains of a taif down on those people who have oppressed you. All you have to do is say the word and Allah will destroy them. Prophets of old had done exactly this. The prophets before had said, okay, Allah, bring retribution on these people. They want it, bring it on them, destroy them. And this prayer of a prophet is a powerful thing and people have been destroyed because of that. But the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was a true mercy to mankind. And he dealt in so much justice. And look what he said. No, I'll pray for them instead. And he prayed and he asked Allah to let people, some children, some offspring, some genealogy from these people who worship you alone without partners. Because that was his message. That was his goal. The only thing he really wanted to do was get this message across to the people. Worship God without partners. Look at that. Look at this sweetness. And this is really dealing in justice. A human being has a difficulty being fair. Oh, I can be fair up to a point, especially if it's in my favor anyway. But what about when it's not in my favor to do something? The order comes in the Quran. Oh, you who believe, you have to deal in justice. You have to be fair. And you have to stand up for justice even when it's against you, your family, and your wealth. You have to tell the truth. You have to be fair. You have to give fair measure. Not easy, but it's something that if you do it, this is going to give you, in this life, a great advantage, and in the next life, absolutely, because Allah will deal with you in justice. Some people might say, well, there's, there's justice in the land, but I have to tell you that I've heard this a lot. I come from a country and a society where people talk a lot about justice. They talk about freedom. They talk about liberty. But when I watch what's being practiced, I see something else. In my country, for instance, we find the majority of all of the people that are incarcerated in prison are black African Americans. Yet they only make up about 25% or so of the population of the entire society. We find that the majority of the people making the laws and enforcing these laws are not the people that are being subjugated and put into prison. Now, I will agree that there are certainly trials that take place. There are judges. There are lawyers. People are getting some justice. 
But is it real justice when we consider that the majority of the people in this country are white, fair-skinned people, yet very few of them wind up in the same condition? So I often wonder myself, if I misunderstood, did they say peace, freedom, liberty, and justice? Or did they say peace, freedom, liberty, for just us? Think about it. Because as Islam teaches us, this beautiful facet, this beautiful part of Islam, being fair and being just, is what it's really all about. Until next time, be fair. Salam alaikum. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Join with us now as we discover the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. And in this episode, I'd like to deal with something called balance. And balance is something all of us should be familiar with. Sometimes when we get our statement in the mail from the bank, we look for the balance. <laughs> and in life itself, we're always looking to find the balance between many things. And Islam offers that balance. The way that we discover the balance of Islam is to go to the Quran, which is the source of everything in Islam. The speech, the speech of Almighty God, Allah. And what does he tell us about balance? He tells us about the balance in nature. He talks to us about something called hydrology and how the water works. You know, 1400 years ago when the Quran was revealed, people didn't really know much about things like this. They didn't know how water evaporated and then became a vapor and then condensed and came back down to the earth as rain. They didn't know about these things, but Allah spoke about it very clearly in the Quran and explained about this. He also explained about the balances in nature. He talks to us about the plants, the trees, the animals. It's amazing when you consider the balance of everything in nature. If you consider the position of the earth to the sun just a few degrees closer and we'd all be well done. <laughs> True. Think about it. We take for granted this position we hold in the universe. But yet, if you think about it, if we were just a few degrees farther away than only on solid ice, would we have any room to play? I'm playing with the poetry a little bit because I wrote a poem about this subject some years ago for the children, talking about this balance, this beautiful balance that Allah has us in. And I recall thinking, too, at that time that this planet, this earth that we all live on, that we take for granted every day, has so much in the beautiful balance. Have you ever thought about this? The, all of the trees, all of their leaves, all over the whole globe, they give off oxygen. Did you know that? Oxygen is coming from these leaves. That's how we breathe. We need those plants, don't we? Without the plants... Where would we get something to breathe? And then, when we think about the air that we let out, called carbon dioxide. Don't confuse that with carbon monoxide. That comes out of cars. But carbon dioxide. And they said that the plants are able to take benefit from us, from what we breathe out, what humans and animals are breathing out. And I was thinking, look at this. The stuff that comes from us as waste, can actually take care of these plants and help them. And what comes out of them as their waste, it's taking care of us. And this is a balance. This is one of the many balances that we find. If we look to sizes, uh, I'm amazed when I consider this, that a human being wouldn't know really what his position was in the universe if it weren't for two things, the telescope and the microscope. Now, when we take the telescope and we look to the planets, we look to the stars and we discover many things. What we find is that 
all of these are spheres, orbs, and they're going in orbits, traveling around in these circles that they're going in. And you wonder, how does that happen? How did they get this direction? Where does it come from? Then when you take that microscope and you look under the microscope and you begin to consider things like molecules and atoms and you learn that they also are little round things going around in these, these orbits, these cycles that they're going through. And look at this. We, the human beings, are right in between. In fact, we couldn't even see these if it weren't for the optical aid of the microscope and for the telescope. All of this helps us to realize how well placed and situated we are in the universe. When our creator, Allah, made everything, he put us in the best of places. He put us in a balance. It's amazing, isn't it, when you consider just that? But also there's other balances that we could talk about. When we talk about how the earth itself is balanced, that it won't wobble or shake or drop us off. And Allah speaks about that and he tells us that he has these mountains that have these long roots that go down, down, like tent pegs, autad. He calls them autad in the Quran. It says they go deep down into the earth. And in fact, this earth crust doesn't move, doesn't shift around because this mountain range, this huge system is in place. So this keeps the earth from wobbling. It also keeps the crust from shifting. And all of this is 1,400 years ago. And today, if you go to the books of geology, I invite you to do that. Go to the library sometime. Check out some books on geology. It's very interesting to compare what we find in today's scientific studies and then compare that to the revelation of the Quran 1,400 years ago. Brand new discovery. Revelation, same thing. <laughs> In fact, it tells us that those roots or those long tent pegs, they go down into the earth for miles and miles and miles. This is something nobody could have guessed. No one could have possibly made such a surmise those many years ago. So this is something really amazing, truly amazing. When we talk about the balance in nature, we talk about the balance in the creation. It's also important for us to talk about the balance of the human being. A human being is composed of more than just bones and flesh and muscle. A human being also has these nerves that cause him to react. And if those nerves get out of balance, then he has a problem. Some of the nerve endings are so sensitive that just blowing on them can cause him to be startled. Others have almost no sense that you could you can do almost anything and it really won't bother them. It depends on that part of the body and how did anybody imagine that we would be so well balanced just in our nerves. And then think about this, the mind. How does the mind work? And scientists are still today trying to figure out what makes the brain work? What makes us tick? What's going on in that head? Psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors around the world are studying and thinking and trying on laboratory rats and monkeys to discover what makes the brain work and why is the animal so much different than the human? What is it that makes the human like they are? What's the balance? Where does that come from? And then there's the soul. We have the body, we have the mind, and we have the soul. Now this soul is something that some scientists will deny it even exists. And then there are those who will acknowledge, well, there's something, but they don't know what it is. But for sure, when the soul is not in balance, then the whole of the human being is not in balance. Because the soul is something that's, well, it's amazing, isn't it? In Arabic, we refer to it as nafs. The nafs, which is the inner desires and the things that, that we look for, we want. This, I need, I need, I need. That's the nafs. 
Then there's something else called the ruh, which is the spirit itself, the very spirit of the human being, without which he would not have any life at all. When the angel of death comes to a person at the end of their life, that's what he takes. He doesn't take out their brain, he doesn't take out their heart, but rather he removes the ruh. And when the ruh is gone, the whole thing ends. What happens next is, most of you have heard about this, called the Day of Judgment. Now, on the Day of Judgment, there's going to be a balance, too. A balance of good versus bad. A scale would be brought and set there, and then a person's good deeds would be put on one side, and then their bad deeds on the other. And when the bad deeds outweigh the goods, this is, this is a serious problem. It could indicate some severe punishment for the person. But then there's something else in this balance. And this is what you really love about Islam, isn't it? There is this thing called Rahmah, the mercy of Allah for those who really believed. And they really did good works. They tried. They made mistakes, but still, you know, they tried and they repented to Allah. And now all of a sudden, just their good belief in La ilaha illallah can be put on the scale on the other side, and then give that balance, that beautiful balance. And this balance is one of the many of the facets of Islam. I want to think about that for a minute and take a break. Stay right where you are. We're going to be right back with more facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We've been talking on the subject of balance. And balance is something very important. Balance in our lives, balance in nature. The balance that happens on the Day of Judgment, which we were just speaking about before the break. I want to come back to that and I want to think about this because in Islam we know that there are some things that a person can do which seem rather small here today, but they can be very big on the balance on the Day of Judgment. By the way, the scale or balance in Arabic is called Al-Mizan. Al-Mizan. And it was said that a man would be brought and he would have no bad deeds. This is just a story to help us to understand something about the mercy of Almighty Allah. It said a man be brought on the Day of Judgment and he'd have no bad deeds, but he'd have a mountain of good deeds. Then they would bring out Al-Mizan, the balance. And on the one side, they would put all of his good deeds. And then on the other side, there wouldn't be anything. Therefore, look, it would be like this. But then they would take the mercy that Allah gave him for one eye, just one eye, and put it on the other side. And it outweighed all of his good deeds. He would be asked, do you like to enter into paradise on your good deeds or on Allah's mercy? Look what he said. Considering all my good deeds, I would go in on that. But then after he sees this, he said, you know, Allah's mercy is much more than all my good deeds, even for one eye. I'll go in on that. I want to remind you about something. One eye. If you cover up, cover up one of your eyes and look around the room. Just look around. Go ahead. I know it's a TV show. Do it. Just cover up your eye and look around the room. Just keep doing that for a minute, okay? What's going to happen, you're going to lose your depth perception. You will not be able to tell how far away something is from you because you only have one eye. But now, remove your... Go ahead. Take your hand off. Got it? Okay. Now, look around the room. And you see the depth? And that's because these two eyes are not exactly in the same place and your head is lined up in the center. So the way your brain is seeing this, you see depth. You're seeing three-dimensional or 3D. And this is something that in the movie business, in the film industry, in televisions, with cameras of any kind, they would love to be able to achieve this, but they can't. The screen that you're looking at right now is flat. And regardless of how we try to put an image up there to make it really look attractive, it's still flat. In order to get the true 3D perception with cameras, it's necessary to have them be stationary and have them fixed a certain way 
and positioned and don't move anything and then take your picture. But as soon as things start to move around, you lose it and you have to work to try to get it back. It's very difficult, very difficult to do 3D. But look at this, every day you're seeing 3D and you never even thought to say thank you to the one who gave it to you. This is what Allah is talking about when he talks about the ingratitude of a human being. They're not thankful even for the small things that he gives them. And your sight is no small thing. Consider that. Consider, too, that you see in color. Now, I don't know if you were watching a black and white TV set, but your eyes are designed so that you see in color. Another big gift that we get. What a beautiful, beautiful teaching in Islam to be appreciative and to say thank you to him for each and everything that we have. How can we properly balance this, these gifts that Allah has given us? And actually you can't. Because no matter what Allah gives you, there's nothing you can give him back that he needs. Allah has no needs. Allah doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't drink. So how can I balance this? How can I give back anything to him? Well, obviously, it should be that I would ask him, what does he want? What is it that he would like to have from me? And he's told us in his book, in no uncertain terms, what we can do. He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ Simply put, he only created us so that we would worship him alone, without partners. Too many times we find people worshiping the creation. People are looking to the creation of Almighty Allah for something to worship, to say thank you to, to be grateful to. When in reality, it should be to him that they give all this praise and thanksgiving. If we could achieve that, if we could do that, then this, this would be something beautiful. The saying of La ilaha illallah. Try that with me. La ilaha illallah. Allah. La ilaha illallah. The saying of this on the day of judgment is very heavy on the balance. Especially if you understand and you mean it. That there is none worthy of my worship, of my devotion, of my love and affection. None is worthy of that except the law. Now, of course, we've been taught also in the balance of things to be appreciative to the human beings. As we learn from Islam, whoever doesn't thank the people, he doesn't thank Allah. So we must always say thank you to each other and be appreciative to each other for what the people are trying to do for us. The balance in the mind, the body, the soul is all a part of Islam. But there's more to that too. The balance in judgment. How do you judge things? Do you judge with balance? Another facet of Islam when we talked about that, we found that there is a balance here too. Even if people, people are against you and you're against them, but still you're asked to judge in a matter, you set aside your prejudice and you judge with fairness. You give the right balance. There's another aspect of this beautiful facet too. And that's the ummah of Islam, the nation itself, of all the Muslims, because in Islam we know that it's the Ummatan Wasitan, the balanced nation, the balance meaning the middle path, taking the middle path, not being extreme to the left or extreme to the right, not being so extreme in your work that you don't have time for your family, but not being so extreme with your family that you don't have time for your worship. Not being so extreme in your worship that you don't have time for the other things to keep the balance, the balance necessary in your life. This perhaps is one of the most important parts about understanding all the other things in life that are balanced so that we can give proper time and devotion to our Lord and at the same time proper time and devotion to our families, to our work, to society and the people around us. Extremism is absolutely the opposite of this beautiful teaching, this facet of balance. 
One of the things that I came to know after getting into Islam is that the good Muslim looks for the things in Islam that put balance in his life and don't distort the beauty of the whole. Because Islam, by the way, also indicates something being whole and complete. When we see people who are spending a lot of time making money, that's what they do. They're very good at it. Or they're famous and they're very good at whatever they do in the entertainment industry. And people see that and this is what the person does. They spend all the time in it. But then they have no time for their families. We're not surprised when we learn that these same celebrities, these same wealthy or famous people, their personal lives are in shambles. Why? Simply because they don't give the proper balance. When we see people who devote all their time to their family and they don't give proper time to their work, obviously they don't do well in business, do they? And if a person devotes all of his time in, in physical worship, in other words, he goes to his church or he goes to his temple or his mosque and he spends all of his time, he's there, he's doing things that are nice, definitely good, but again, the family is home suffering. They're not getting their rights. We spoke about this early on when we talked about these facets of Islam about giving the rights. The rights to the family is very important. How can I give my mother her rights if I never go see her? How do I give rights to my wife or my children if I'm constantly somewhere else in another country, for instance? You have to have a balance in the life. Now, of course, we know that there are circumstances when a person is put into something that they can't help happens to me all the time. But still, I have to strive to find a balance. And when I come home to my family, I need to take time. I need to be with them. I need to listen. I need to be a part of what they're doing. And when I worship Allah, I need to focus on that. I need to really focus on my worship to Allah and not be busied with other things. So when you're in the masjid, if you're in your prayers, in your fasting, whatever you're doing for Allah, think about that. And then when you're at work, think about your work. And when you're playing and having fun, think about that. Any psychiatrist, any mental health counselor will tell you that this is the logical way to give a balance to your life. Be where you are. Think about what you're doing. And don't worry about the other things. You know, my father used to teach us that. He used to tell us, that most of the things you worry about are not going to happen anyway. And it's true. It's very true. How many times have we worried and worried, oh, uh, this thing, oh, it could, be, it could be like this, it could be... And then we find it didn't happen. And the reason because we're not balancing our life, we're using our time incorrectly. When we're in worship, think about Allah. When with our family, think about our family. When we're at work, do our work. Now, overall, this is overall, behind it all, we do think about Allah. We remember Allah in all that we do. And we thank Him for our family, and we thank Him for our job, for our education, for our position, whatever we have, we're very thankful to Him. We don't forget Allah, but we do try to keep this balance, this important balance, this beautiful facet of Islam. And I pray that Allah will always keep us well balanced as Muslims. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. For the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about another of the beautiful facets of Islam. And in this particular one, I'm very satisfied with it because that's the facet. It's called satisfied. Now, when we talk about satisfied, what do we mean by that? To be satisfied is to be complete, 
To be satisfied is to have enough. To be satisfied is to be pleased. But what we want to know now, we're going to talk about the purpose of our life. Our purpose to worship our Lord, recognizing him as one, the one God, and we're going to do our best to satisfy him. How? By doing what he wants us to do. And then in return, he will satisfy us. How? By giving us what we want. What is it that every human wants? Peace. And how will we get it? By satisfying our Lord and performing according to what he has mandated. The rules or commandments of our Lord are rather simple. Just as the people before us were not ordered anything more than to worship Allah alone, without any partners. Establish the regular salah or prayers and pay the zakah, which means the poor do or charity. And this is the way of life that's been ordained for us by our Lord, just as it was for the people before. Because actually this way of life, this deen has never really changed. It's always been essentially the same thing. Whether you call it deen or you call it Islam, it doesn't matter. What matters is, do you really do it? Do you really try to satisfy your Lord? Because if you think about it, it doesn't matter who you satisfy in this world. Let's say, for instance, you make somebody happy. Your parents are satisfied with you, which is a very good thing in Islam. But if your Lord's not satisfied, what would be the benefit? Your wife, your children, your boss at work, even your friends. We're always trying to please others. I want to make them happy. I want to make them happy. But is this enough? And what if I do so at the expense of making my Lord unsatisfied with me? And some people, they'll do a lot of things to show off for their friends. They want to act like big macho man, you know? Want to show off. Some people drinking, drugs, smoking alcohol, all of the bad things, and they think it's something big to show off for their friends. Others show off by spending money. I want to show how I am. Look at this. I'll buy this. I'll buy that. Even they do some things for other people to show off. Look, look what I'm doing. See? Trying to satisfy other people. But if it didn't satisfy the Lord above, what would be the benefit? There is a saying from Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, that I really like, because it is so simple, yet it makes so much sense when we talk about this word satisfy. He said, whoever tries to please the people at the expense of displeasing their Lord, they've already displeased their Lord. And he's going to make the people displeased with them anyway. But whoever tries to please his Lord, even if it's at the expense of displeasing the people, his Lord will be pleased with him. And he will make the people pleased with him too. Allah is looking at your heart always. Your intentions are a very important part of what you do. So because you have the intention to do these good works, he counts it as though you did it. Because he knows you have to do these other things as well. So don't be afraid to take care of the daily things you have to do. But do plan to do as much as you can for your Lord as you can do it. And this will help you to keep another beautiful facet called balance that we've talked about as well. Those who come to the right belief, they believe there's only one God. And they want to worship him on his terms. Those people who do that, and then they put that into practice as best they can, they've already pleased their Lord. And he's pleased with them, and he will make them be pleased. He will make them be pleased by giving them what they really want. A human being seeks after peace more than anything else. The reason we do the things that we do is because we think that those things will ultimately give us the peace, give us the satisfaction that we're looking for. But will they? 
if I get the education that I've always wanted, will it really give me the peace? If I get the job, the position, will it really give me the peace that I want? If I get the rank in the military, will it really give me the peace? The wife, the house, the children, the fancy car, all of these things we strive, we work for, because we want to be satisfied. We want to be pleased with these things. We want to feel like, ah, now I'm satisfied. I have my place in the Bahamas. Huh? I have my place on the lake or my place on the river that I can retire to and be satisfied. But will I ever really achieve that? Because when I actually get to that home in the Bahamas or on the riverside or the lake, wherever it is, when I get there, I'll find that I have to work on it. The roof is leaking. The plumbing needs fixing. The electrical things need work on it. Oh, they have to take care of the grass. Oh, this tree is falling over on the roof. So many problems. And the reason because I'm trying to be satisfied with the wrong thing. All of us working, striving, trying to get what? This peace, this satisfaction. But it won't come. It won't come until we realize that the only thing satisfying us is to have the right belief and the right action to go with it. Then, no matter what else happens, be okay. Listen to this. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used a word in Arabic called ajib. This word ajib, it means amazing. Ajiban. The condition of the believer is amazing because only good comes his way. When any of the good things of life come to him, he's appreciative and he thanks his Lord. Alhamdulillah. But any difficulty, any kind of fitna, calamity or trial comes his way, he makes suffer. He's patient with his Lord. And it's good for him. It's good for him. But it's only in the case of the believer. We find that this attitude of finding satisfaction in the material things doesn't work. What we seek for in what's called hayat dunya the material world, as we seek and strive and run for that, we find it runs away from us. As I try to get close to it, it runs away. But when we strive and work for the things of Akhir, meaning the next life, I find that it's very nice. Because when I work for that, that's something that no matter how I work toward it, it will build and it will never go away. Because it's permanent. That life is the only permanent life. In fact, we find in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 64 of the Quran, the very clear teaching that this life, this Hayat dunya that we're living in every day, this is just frivolous. This is folly. This is not the real life. The real life is waiting for us. And it's eternal. And it won't go away. You want to be satisfied? I know I do. And the only satisfaction is going to come in the proper understanding and application of these teachings, of these facets these facets in Islam. So many times when we look to the things that we want this life, it doesn't work. But just with a little bit, a little bit of effort, a little bit of imagination, and start to do what? To work for the things of the afterlife. You don't have to give up your life here, but you work alongside that with the things for the next life. And you'll find it's nice, very peaceful, very beautiful. We want to take a break and give you a chance to reflect on what we've been talking about here with this particular facet, this facet of Islam. Satisfy, satisfy. Taking a break, going to be right back. Don't go away. Salaam alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We've been talking about the subject of satisfy. 
And we talked about the concept of Allah, God Almighty, being satisfied with us and us being satisfied with Him in this life. We touched a little bit on the subject of being satisfied in the next life. Let us look now to the Quran and consider some of the things that are promised for those who satisfy the conditions of the kalama of La ilaha illallah. When a person really believes that there's only one God and they begin to do the deeds of righteousness, they begin to satisfy the condition of being a human being in good status with their Lord. Now, the promise. The promise in the Quran is for those who believe and do good works to be in paradise. To be in one of the many levels of paradise wherein they will find the most beautiful of treasures. They will find gardens underneath which rivers are flowing. They'll find food of all descriptions that's most delicious. Rivers of milk, honey, and more. They will find their pleasant faces. They will find those who will be greeting them also satisfied saying peace, salam, salam, wearing beautiful clothing, reclining on couches, so lovely, and the temperature will be just right, not hot, not cold, but just the proper coolness to satisfy. Now this is promised for those who come to the right belief and do good works, satisfied. In the Quran, Allah tells it like this. For those who believe, he said, al those who amanu, believe, wa'amilu, and they have good deeds, salihat, of righteousness. For them is promised, promised the genital for those, which is the highest, the highest level. Genital na'im, which is the paradise of the favor of their Lord. All of these paradises mentioned, and it says, underneath which rivers flow, beautiful gardens, beyond your imagination, what the eye has never beheld, the ear has never heard, the taste, the smells, everything, totally satisfied. Radi Allahu an wa radu an. It means Allah is satisfied, pleased with them, and they're pleased with their Lord. And this is promise for those who sacrifice, sacrifice in this life for the next life. At the same time, we realize that Islam is not about extremism. And this definitely needs to be mentioned because in order to satisfy the conditions of Islam, there has to be this peace. And we don't find this peace. We don't find this balance, another beautiful facet of Islam. We don't find those things in extremism. Everything has to be according to the balance, according to the peace, and according to this, this beautiful coming together of all these facets. And then that satisfies. Satisfies the mind, the soul, the heart. Satisfies the Lord above. It all works together. Everything, just like beautiful clockwork coming together, satisfied. One of the things when we talk about the satisfaction is that we won't really, ourselves in this life, consider it enough. We'll keep working as long as we can. We won't sit back and say, ah, oh, I've done enough for today. I'm satisfied. No, no, no. That's not the kind of satisfaction that we've been talking about. Actually, what we mean here is that we'll work even harder to be sure that we do satisfy and please our Lord. How? How can I be sure? How can I know without doubt that I'm doing the thing that will please my Lord the most? And I recall that when I first came into Islam, I learned something very important, very valuable. And that is that you cannot guarantee to anybody they are going to be successful with their Lord unless he is pleased, unless he's satisfied. And you won't really know that till the day of judgment. So the striving and the working is always a part and parcel 
of the human being in this life. What about the people? That while I was in this life, I went around hurting people, saying things against them or to them, maybe insulting somebody, maybe speaking behind their back, carrying tales. All of these things are bad, of course, but they're even worse on the Day of Judgment. Because now, even though, let us say, that the person's salah is perfect, he has done all of his prayers, mashallah, lovely, lovely. And he avoided the Day of Judgment. He's ready to go to the paradise. Let me in, let me in, he's saying. But no, there's another matter to be satisfied. What is it? The people that you have damaged are standing there waiting for their rights. And you will not enter paradise unless and until the rights of others have been satisfied. And they will want their rights. And until their rights are satisfied, you're not going to enter the paradise. Pretty scary, isn't it, when you think about it? We have to work each day as though it were our last day. We don't know how many days we have left. Oh, sure, you might have done a lot of good deeds in your life, but then after a while you start thinking, you know, I did all these good deeds. That ought to be good enough to satisfy. I can go out and do what I want to now. Maybe I'll do X or Y or Z or something, you know. Don't want to give you any ideas. <laughs> so now, though, the person does some bad deeds and he dies in that condition, he dies in a very miserable, miserable situation. Because all the work that he did in the beginning can be canceled out by doing all this bad now. Let me explain how that works, if I can. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us that a person would go through the whole life acting so bad, so evil, that he was like somebody from hell fire. He'd be so close that he could almost put his hand into it. But then before he dies, what's been written for him overtakes him. And he acts like the people of paradise. He begins to change. He does the righteous things. He's doing good deeds. He believes correctly. He's trying to make amends, basically, for what he's done in the past to satisfy that. And it does. It satisfies you, Lord. And guess what happens? As a result, he dies in this and he goes to paradise. But then there'll be another person, he said who will go through the whole life acting like somebody from paradise, somebody from Jannah. Oh, and he does good deeds, and he's kind, and he's generous, and he worships his Lord. He does this, he does that. But then, when he's so close, he could almost put his hand right into the paradise. But what's written for him overtakes him. And he begins to act like the people of the hellfire doing X, Y, and Z, doing these bad, evil things, forgetting about his Lord, not satisfying this condition, and then he dies, and then as a result of this, he enters into the hellfire. And we ask Allah to save all of us from that. This is a very important facet of Islam, to always keep in mind that we strive, we strive every day hard to satisfy, to satisfy our Lord above. Although we know He is perfect, absolutely perfect in every aspect, and we know we're not, and we could never be perfect. But what we know as Muslims is we weren't created to be perfect. Although we were created perfect, but we weren't created to be perfect, meaning that we have free will, free choice, that at any time that you want to change how you are, you can do so, whether it be for the good or for the bad. It's up to you, it's up to me. We each make our own choices, right? So here's your chance for this good choice, this good choice to satisfy. Now, in some religions, they might teach you that you can never satisfy your Lord, so somebody has to sacrifice for you. Some religions in the past have actually had the notion of throwing innocent people into a fire, into a volcano, 
throwing the virgin into the volcano or into the river. They used to do that in the Nile River, thinking that that would satisfy the god of the river, and then they would have water that would come. But in Islam, we don't have that. No, the only sacrifice that Allah is going to accept is your sacrifice. Your sacrifice of what? Give up the false pride, stay away from the lies, come to the reality that there really is one God. He's one, not two or three or 30,000. It's just one. And you worship him as such. And then try your best to satisfy him, even if it's something small. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that you could even take this strip out of a date stone. <laughs> I don't know if you ever ate dates, but there's a pit or stone in there. You take it out and it has this thread laying over it. He said you could even give this, give this thread of a date stone in charity. If it was done with sincerity, that that would count. That could count to satisfy your Lord. Because he's not looking for quantity, is he? What's important with your Lord is sincerity. Because when you're sincere, really sincere with your Lord, that will satisfy. And we ask Almighty Allah that he accept this, that our effort here in our studios and with our television programming, we ask him to be satisfied with what we're doing and we hope it will help you to satisfy your Lord. This is Yusuf Estes reminding you that these facets, these beautiful facets of Islam will only work, will only be satisfied if you put them into practice. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Islam, like the precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. Today we want to talk about one of the very amazing and beautiful facets called time. Now we all understand time, or do we? Do we really? What is time? Well, you look at your watch, you say, well, you've been talking for about 32 seconds. But wait just a minute. I want to ask you again. Think about it. Do you really know what's time? The next time you're sitting in the doctor's office, in the clinic or the hospital, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and you ask, how long have we been sitting here? They say, about 15 minutes. You say, no, it seems like so long. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting. If you go to the driver's license bureau or a government office and you have to wait and you think, oh my gosh, the time, the time, the time. Yet when you're doing something you really enjoy, maybe it's your favorite sport or activity, something that you really get a benefit out of, and you say, oh, this is great. And somebody says, we have to go now. And you say, why? They say, the time has gone. No, but, but we just got here. No, you've been here for two hours. Two hours? No. Yes. Why? And when I'm in traffic, how about in traffic? How the time passes in traffic? Everything has its own time, but it's according to what? A lot of it's according to how you look at it, how you feel about it. Actually, it depends on what you're doing during that time as to how valuable it really is. Allah talks about time in the Quran. The believer is admonished to pay close attention to what Allah says in the Quran about time. He says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem Bismillahi rahmani rahim Wal asr Inna al-insana lafi khusr the meaning of this chapter of the Quran called Surah Al-Asr has been discussed and elaborated on by many of the biggest scholars over time. 
they have explained to us in minute detail many of the aspects of the words that we hear. But to sum it up for the benefit of our program today, Allah now is swearing, and it's a mighty thing when you consider your Lord, the creator, the sustainer, the universal owner of everything, and he is swearing by time, the passage of time. And he says, I swear, I swear by this, and it's something you and I, as we just discussed, we really don't have a handle on it, do we? And Allah is swearing by time that all of the creation of the human beings is in khusr, khusr. It means great loss, great loss. Those human beings who are in this loss are like somebody bankrupt. It means on the day of judgment, they will not be able to pay. They will not be able to satisfy their Lord. They won't be able to come up with enough to offset, offset what Allah has given us in his favors. And in this condition, that human being will be there thinking, oh my God, oh, I wish I had sent something ahead for this day. This is also mentioned in the Quran, that on that day, he'll be saying that. Why? Why? But it's too late, isn't it? Far too late is it now, at this time, to start to talk about what I should have done in the past. And he says, they're all, all of the human beings, not this, that, a few odd ones here and there, all of the human beings will be in khusar. And then he says, illa. Now, illa means with the exception of, and I want to know who are those who are not included. Illa. Ladina, except for those who come to the correct belief, the belief, the belief in Allah as one. And, and they do the amal salihat, actions or deeds of the righteous. And they tawasso. What is that? They tawasso. They encourage. They exhort. They push each other in the haq, the truth. And we spoke about that in some of the other facets of Islam. The truth of all of the things that Islam stands for. The truth of Islam that there's only one God. The truth of Islam that you must do the deeds of righteousness. The truth that comes along with all of these beautiful facets that we've been talking about. And they tawasso encourage and exhort each other to sabr. What is sabr? Some people said it just means patience, but it's far more than this. This is to persevere. This is to be steadfast. And this is to hang in there. Don't give up. Sabr, sabr. Hang on. Be patient. Again, reflect on these words, what Allah has said to us. All the people of hell, and he's swearing, swearing a mighty swearing. All these people going to hell. Except for those who have the right belief. And I want to talk to you about that just for a second. Somebody came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and said, could you tell us something? Tell us something about this deen, this way of Islam that you're calling to. Something that only you could tell us. He said to that man, Kul. Say, I believe in Allah, and then be steadfast on what you said. Now you might wonder, there's not much to that. That seems simple enough. What, just say, okay, I believe in Allah, that's it. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but do you think you're going to be left alone on saying, I believe, and you won't be put into a test? Ha, <laughs> ha. I got news for you. You better go get the Quran. And open it up to the 29th chapter and look clearly what it says. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alif Lam Meem. Ahasa bin Nasu an Yutriku an Yakulu Amana, Wahum La Yuftanu. Do the people think that they're going to be left alone on saying we believe? 
and they're not going to be put into a great test, a great fitna, actually, a calamity, a trial, and Allah continues as those before them, because Allah put them also into the great trials because of their saying, we believe. And then he tells you why. Allah doesn't have to tell you why he does anything, but he tells you to show the truthful of those who are true asadiq and expose the liars, kathib, in their lies. Oh yeah, if you say, I believe in Allah, you're going to be tested. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And then it's all going to come out if you were telling the truth anyway. It's important to consider that before you say, well, I'd like to be a Muslim. Well, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, but you better think about it before you open your mouth because when you say it, you are putting yourself in a test. It's strange, isn't it, the way I just said that? Because shouldn't I be trying to tell you all the nice, lovely little things about Islam, trying to butter you up, trying to get you, come on, come on, be a Muslim. But this is not Islam. In fact, this is always your choice, not mine. My only job as any Muslim's job, is to convey a message. Share Islam, simple message. If you'd like to accept it, well and good. If not, choice is with you. I remember <laughs> some people were talking to me about Islam, and they were thinking about whether or not they'd like to be a Muslim. And I told them, I said, in our religion, we have a hope of paradise, we have a fear of the hellfire, and we live in between these two things. This is part of the balance in Islam. We're constantly hoping and seeking for this reward from Allah. At the same time, we're afraid of any punishment from Him. And they said, well, if we come into your religion, could you promise us, guarantee us that we're going to go to paradise? I said, if somebody come to your religion, could you promise it? They said, oh, sure. Anybody comes to our religion, right away, that's the first thing we promise them. You're going to paradise because once saved, always saved. I said, I see. Okay. Well, that's not true in Islam. We don't promise you anything. Nothing. Except what? I can promise you hellfire. That's real easy to promise. Just mess up. Just do the wrong things and you can go to hell real easy. But if you want to go to paradise, this is something else. It requires a commitment. It requires a sincere and devout dedication, love, and devotion to your Creator. And not 99%, 100%. And I don't know what's inside of you, so I can't promise you anything, but your Lord can, because He knows you. He knows what's in you, and you don't know what's in Him. So at any time, and that's the subject we're talking about time, at any time, a person could die and go to paradise, or maybe not. Let you think about that one for a few minutes. I'm going to take a break now, give you some time to reflect. Now, don't go away, because we're going to be right back. We're going to be talking more about this subject of time and timelessness. And these are all different facets, facets of Islam. Stay tuned, right? <laughs> Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host on Facets of Islam. Today's episode, we want to talk about one of the most important of all facets. It's called ilm or knowledge. Almost everybody will agree that knowledge is a very important part of life. You can hardly go through life without some kind of knowledge, can you? And Islam certainly is no different. But in Islam, we have a way of understanding knowledge from a special perspective. We use the word in Arabic, ilm. And we find immediately that this is one of the names of the Almighty. He is the Alim. There isn't anything anywhere in the universe except that he knows everything about it. 
every leaf on every tree, every single blade of grass. He knows where it is, and he knows when it will die, and he knows all about the whole universe. Think about that for a minute. Even in the sea, the depths of the ocean, places that human beings haven't even been yet, Yet he knows everything that's there. Every creature, every plant, any animal, he has full knowledge. The farthest reaches of the universe, all the way past anything that we can imagine. And yet he knows about it. And that's one of his names, Alalim. His perfect and complete knowledge of all that exists. It makes you wonder, what do we really know? When we're born as a child, what do we really know? Islam teaches us that we're born in a natural condition to already be in submission to the will of God. Therefore, we are in the right way as soon as we're born. We've been created perfectly by him. But then as we gain our knowledge and we start using our choices, the choices that he's given us, that's when we begin to make our mistakes, isn't it? What knowledge do we really have? except that he had to give it to us in the first place. He tells us in the Quran, in chapter 2, verse 255. <laughs> that he has full knowledge of all things. All knowledge of everything is between his hands. He knows it all. And you, meaning you and I, we have no knowledge except the knowledge that he's given us. And even that's on loan to us like a library book that we have to check back in, isn't it? Because just as he gives knowledge in the first place, he can take it. How often? How often do we forget something? Every single day. Something that, well, I knew that a minute ago. I come to my combination lock and I can't remember the combination. I want to call somebody. I knew that number. Now I don't know it anymore. The actor on the stage who suddenly can't remember their lines and they're ha, ha, whoa, gone, just like that. The elders who used to be so wise, they had so much knowledge. We used to go to them and listen and sit at their feet to take from this, this wealth of knowledge. But then suddenly something happens and they get older and they don't remember anymore. And even they forget their own name. They call it dementia or Alzheimer's. It doesn't really matter what you call it. It's the same thing. They're returning back, as Allah said. He returns them back to their original state. Like the baby. The baby. Having almost no knowledge at all. Knowledge. Should we seek knowledge? Is there anything in Islam telling us that we need knowledge. Well, common sense says, yeah, you won't know anything unless you go out and start working to get some knowledge. And it makes sense. What does Islam teach us? It teaches us that it's the responsibility and obligation of every single Muslim to go out in the path of knowledge. Even so that while they're out seeking this knowledge of this way called Islam, that there are angels praying for them, that all the creation is praying for them, asking Allah's mercy on them while they're seeking this knowledge. And they're considered in the path, the path of Allah, the whole time they're doing it. It's nice. I like that. The first word that came in the Quran was an order, an order to Muhammad, peace be upon him, to do something. And in the Arabic language, you can understand it because the angel Gabriel came to him while he was fasting. He was in a cave. He was fasting, worshiping Allah in the month of Ramadan. And in a certain night, the angel came to him and grabbed him and held him close to him. And then he released him and he commanded him in the Arabic language, Iqara, Iqara. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, responded, La ana bikari. And then the angel grabbed him again and pressed him to his chest and squeezed him and released him and he said to him again, Yaqara. Again, the response from Muhammad, peace be upon him. And again, the same thing. 
pressing him to the chest and commanding again, Ikra bismi rabbika ladi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, ikra wa rabbukul akram, aladi alamu bil kalam, alam al-insana ma lam yalam. Talking about knowledge. What did it say? What do we understand from this? Ikra. Some people mistranslate this, by the way, and they will tell you it means read, and it doesn't. It's a much bigger word. It's more inclusive than the simple English word read. In Arabic, it implies something like reading from memory or reciting. Recite. Recite the recitation. The Quran, by the way, is from the same root. Qara'a. This is the root in Arabic for both words. It means the recitation. The Quran is the recitation of the speech of Allah. Quran. But this recitation is what he was commanding the angel is commanding Muhammad, peace be upon him, to do. Iqra, recite for me. That's what he's saying. Muhammad is responding by saying, but I'm not a reciter. Again, we want to be sure you understand. Because if you use the word read here, it doesn't make any sense. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never knew how to read. He never learned how to read and write. So that wasn't what was being said here. What was being said is for him to recite something. Because after all, the angel is an agent, messenger, coming from Almighty God. And we just said that God knows everything. Certainly he knew that Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't know how to read or write. So he didn't order him to read. He ordered him to recite. Recite from memory. He said, I'm not a reciter. Because that was something very popular at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Very popular for people to go around reciting different things. It was so popular, it was almost like a sport, and everybody liked to partake of it. And they would compare and have competitions in their reciting, their poetry, and the things that they did by reciting anything. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not one of those who liked to do that. So that's why he was saying, La Anabikari, I'm not a reciter. But listen to the rest of it and you'll understand about the knowledge because it says recite in the name of your Lord who created, created the human being from a leech-like clot of blood. Recite and your Lord is most generous who taught man how to use the pen, taught man what he didn't know. Now, in Arabic, it uses that same word, alim, alim, or ilm. All of these are from the same. Yalamu means the same about this word, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. So Allah is saying he's giving knowledge, giving knowledge of the use of the pen, giving knowledge of what people didn't have. All knowledge coming from him. And we're learning, we're taking that, then we can put it into practice. And that's certainly something important to us, isn't it? Oh, there's so much more about this knowledge. This aspect of Islam, we could just keep going on and on, but we have to take a break. We're going to take a break right now, but hold on to this thought, this thought about the facet of Islam called knowledge. Now, we'll be right back. Don't go away with more of facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes your host here on Facets of Islam, and we're back. We've been talking about this facet of Islam called ilm or knowledge. We discovered early on in the program that this is actually one of the names of Allah, al-alim, ilm. This is knowledge, ilm. Allah is al-alim, which means he has full knowledge. He is the epitome of that word, knowledge. His knowledge extends over everything. He has full knowledge of the whole universe. There's no part of the universe except he knows all about it. After all, he's the only creator. He's the only sustainer. He's the only provider. He's the only one who really is the king of the universe. All that knowledge. And to think that he's told us we don't even have any knowledge except that that he gives us. We know in Islam that it's important for us to seek knowledge, to go out and be educated. But exactly for what? Because some people will say, well, I want my children to get a degree. I need my children to get a bachelor's, an MA, a BS, PhD. 
I need them to get these degrees. Why? Because Allah told us in the Quran, Iqra. Iqra. That's not correct. Because it didn't say read, and we already discovered that. It said recite. So the knowledge that Allah was really talking about getting is the knowledge of the Quran itself. So many of the parents who are pushing their children to get these degrees, go and be a geologist. Go out and become an engineer. I need you to be a doctor, a pharmacist. At least I need you to be something. And then say, and Allah ordered it because he said, Iqra. Not true. It's very clear in Islam. The meaning here is recite. And how many of these children that grow up to get these degrees can recite the Quran properly with the proper intonation, the proper tajweed, or have the correct knowledge of the meaning of it. It's a rhetorical question, but I think you know the answer. Very few, if any. The knowledge that's needed in Islam is first of all, the knowledge of Allah. To know that Allah is one, uniquely one, there's none like unto him, and that all worship, all thanksgiving, and all praise is for him only. That's the first thing to know. To know his attributes. To know what we call his names or characteristics and how he is the epitome of each of those. Because if you really understand it, you won't make the mistakes that people do in other religions. Because it's only in Islam where we see that Allah is absolutely perfect in every aspect and every respect. Because if you understand he's perfect in each one of these attributes, you won't make the mistake of saying something that will take you away from Islam. Let's consider. First of all, Allah is al hay This means alive. But because he is the epitome of that word, He's totally and completely alive always, means he doesn't die. Therefore, for Muslims, we know God doesn't die. If somebody said God died, we'd be like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Allah is always alive. And he's self-subsisting. Al-Qayyum means that he totally takes care of himself. Whatever his needs are, are between him and himself, and he has no needs because he is Allah. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't need any sleep because he is Allah. He's absolute. It means he doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, doesn't drink. Well, the things that human beings do has nothing to do with him. In fact, we know that he's so perfect in every aspect that he's not even male or female. But you don't say it about him because in the Arabic language, first of all, there's no word for that. You can't do that. Every word in Arabic that's a noun has a gender associated with it except this word, Allah. And there's no gender. No gender to it. Allah is Allah. Now, when you know these things, you won't make the mistake of saying what some people say. For instance, somebody could ask you, well, can Allah do anything? Ah, but your knowledge of Allah, you'll realize, don't say yes. Instead, you say, Allah can do anything he wants to do. Hmm? Because he would never want to do something that would be against his own nature and not make him be Allah anymore. For instance, if a person said, can Allah do anything? And somebody says, yeah, can he die? You say, no. Oh, I thought you said he could do anything. That's something he can't do. So see, they're playing with words. But you avoid that if you have the understanding. Allahu ala kulli shayin kadir. Means Allah can do anything he wants to do. He has the power to do as he wills. That's what we mean by the statement. Oh. So now they can't trick you anymore. If they say, well... Could Allah cheat, lie, steal? No, because all of these things would be against his attributes. He's not going to cheat anybody. He's ideal. He's fair. He's just. One of the facets of Islam that we've already talked about. He's not going to lie. <laughs> we know that very clearly because he's al-haq, the absolute truth. Another facet we've talked about.
So if you understand these things, you're not going to say this about Allah. You say Allah is capable of doing whatever he wants to do, but he never wants to do anything that's against his attributes. And he never, ever, ever oppresses. Because oppression is the opposite of mercy. And he is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. He is the generally merciful and the specifically merciful. Completely and totally merciful. So, no way he's going to oppress. And he said that, that he never oppresses, ever. And he hates it when we oppress each other. In fact, that nothing compares to him. There isn't anything like him. Nowhere in the universe is there anything like Allah. Laysa kamithlihi shay'in wa huwa samiun basir. This is from the Quran. There isn't anything like him at all. And he is samiun basir, which means all hearing. Doesn't compare to my hearing. His hearing is total. He hears anything and everything, anywhere, anytime, any place, And he is all seeing. Not like my seeing, I can only see in front of me. I can't see behind me. I certainly can't see on the other side of the earth, but he's seeing the whole universe all at the same time. So he is the total, he is the epitome of each thing. And when you get this knowledge, you begin to understand some of the things, what to say, what not to say. And you get the real knowledge of who your creator is. Now, is he omnipresent in his creation? If you say yes, then you're going to have that problem of putting him back in creation. But if you understand what he's telling us, he's as close to you in his mercy, in his knowledge, in his love, in his compassion, in his forgiveness. He's as close to you with these qualities of his as your own juggler vein in your neck. And when you get up in the night and you pray to him, he's as close to you as if he was right in front of you in his what? In his attributes, but never in his person. Because Allah, even the word person, we wouldn't say that about Allah, would we? Not really. Allah is beyond anything you can compare him to. It's best just to say what he said. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth. In six periods of time, then he rose up or went up and he's over his arsh, above his throne. That's what we know about him. And this is just some of the knowledge that he's given us about him. The knowledge about Allah is number one. But then the knowledge of how to worship him. What does he want from us? And we know that we have to pray five times a day. This is some of the knowledge that we have as Muslims. We know that he wants us to fast the month of Ramadan. We know how to fast it according to the right way. According to the Quran and the way of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. We know that there's something called zakah. And the knowledge of how to calculate it. And figure the percentage of your wealth that you hold for a period of a year and how much of it is taxable and to whom it must be distributed. All of this is part of the knowledge in Islam. And then this thing called Umrah and Hajj, the pilgrimage to go, to go as Abraham and Ismail and all of the prophets, how they used to go and make this pilgrimage to Mecca and how they did it. And all of this is a part of the knowledge that you gain in Islam, the knowledge of the Arabiya, to know the Arabic language, the knowledge of the Quran, how it was revealed, how it came, what does it actually mean when Allah says something, and then we can understand the deep, deep meaning. There's an incident talking about knowledge that took place. I'd kind of like to wrap up this segment with this and let you think about it. At the time of Omar, when he was the caliph, they were sitting together in a circle. And some people were complaining about this young boy who was there. And they were saying, you know, this young man, and we're the older people, the elders here. Yeah, just let him go somewhere else. Make more room for us. And Omar stopped him and said, what is the meaning of this? And he recited a surah from the Quran, one of the chapters like this. And they each tried to give, oh, it means this, it means that. It means uh, when the help of your Lord comes and you see the victory, then just um, like uh, him, the praises of your Lord, turning to him in repentance, something like that. And he said, no, no, hold on. 
ask this boy, what does it mean? What did Allah mean when he revealed this surah, this chapter? And the boy said, he was indicating that Muhammad was going to die. What? Nowhere in there did I hear the word Muhammad. I didn't hear the word moat, death. How did you get that? Because he knew from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the significance of this surah, this chapter, that it did indicate that this was now the end of his mission. The help of Allah had come. They had opened Mecca. The Muslims were triumphant. False worship was destroyed. And now it was complete. Everything was complete. And the boy understood. And that's when Omar said, I don't know anything other than what this boy said. So true knowledge in Islam comes through Allah. And we get it like this. And Allah tells us in the Quran how to get it. We say, Rabbi Zidni Ilma. Try it. Rabbi Zidni Ilma. Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Knowledge. This beautiful, wonderful facet. Facet of Islam. Ilm. Till next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, here on the Facets of Islam with a very special episode about the facet that seems to me to connect all of the other facets of Islam. The Quran. The Quran is a subject much bigger than me. In fact, the subject of the Quran is so much so that if you were to take all of the pens of the earth and fill them with all the ink that you could find, you could never ever begin to write enough to talk about this amazing Quran. The word Quran comes from the root in Arabic, Qa-ra-a. And from this we find many beautiful words. We find Qari, the one who recites. Iqra, you recite. And Qur'an, that which is being recited. We find that it's the recitation or speech of Almighty Allah. It's the last and the final revelation of all the Wahi or revelation that has come to the prophets, starting with Adam, Moses, Abraham, Jesus, Muhammad, all of these prophets, they came and they shared a message with the people. And their message, it's here, it's in the Quran. And it tells us, it tells us what the purpose of life is. It tells us who is Allah. It tells us who we are. It tells us about this life, the next life tells us so much. The Quran, the speech of Allah, is recitation. Often we have people ask us about this and they say, well, wouldn't you say that the Quran is the holy book of the Muslims? I say it's more than that. Because a book in Arabic language is called kitab. And then it tells us in the Quran that this is the last and the final of all the revelations. And then it has a gift that comes with it. The gift of preservation. Allah promises us to preserve the Quran until the last day. This promise from Allah is holding true even now. When we find that people around the world still recite this recitation as it was recited at the time of Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The Quran confirms and it negates. It confirms that there really is a law and he's a one, a one and only God. It negates false worship. It negates that there would be any deities beside him. It also negates evil. 
lies and misconceptions. It confirms to us the simple, pure, and pristine belief that there truly is a God, and he's one without partners, and he's shown us in his book, in this Quran, we know how to worship him. Many of the facets that we have been talking about and will talk about in other episodes can be directly linked to this Quran. Allah tells us so many beautiful statements in the Quran and he talks about it himself and refers to it as the Quran. I have it open here to chapter 36, if you go by the numbers, called Yasin, Surah Yasin. It says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Yasin, Wal Quran Al-Hakim. Allah says, Yasin, and these are two of the letters of the Arabic language. Allah swears by the Quran itself that it's full of wisdom. And then he tells the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he is indeed one of the messengers of Allah. And he's on a straight way. And it is a revelation. This revelation is sent down on Zalna, sent down by Allah the exalted in might, most merciful, in order that you may admonish the people whose fathers had received no admonition and who therefore remain heedless of the signs of Almighty God. If you can imagine this coming down to a human being, this revelation in the Arabic language, if you could imagine something like this, you could truly appreciate it a lot more. When you hear me talk about this in the English language, I have to tell you, there's a lot that's lost in the translation. You see, the Quran isn't just a book. It's more than that. It's from a book, a mighty book, the book with a law. In a place preserved in the paradise. When we have a translation offered to us, we really don't have the Qur'an anymore. The reason is because the Qur'an doesn't really translate. It doesn't, it doesn't really go into any other language. In fact, it's impossible to bring any book like it. The challenge that Allah offers in the Qur'an makes that clear. He says, if you're in doubt about it, then bring a book like it. And of course, this is a challenge that can't be met. He tells us that it is the Quran in the Arabiya, which means the Arabic language. So if it's not in Arabic, it's not the Quran. And even when it's in Arabic, if it's not the same recitation that came to Muhammad, it's still not the Quran. This recitation or Quran has come down it was sent down to Muhammad in Laylatul Qadr, in the night of power. And it tells us that in Quran as well, that it was Anzalna sent down by Allah, fi Laylatul Qadr, in the night, the night of power, the month of Ramadan, while the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was fasting, in a cave in Jabal Nur, the mountain of light, near Mecca. He's fasting, he's praying, and the angel Gabriel comes to him and orders him, Ikara, recite. Ikara, bismi rabbi kalade khalaq, recite in the name of your Lord who created khalaqal insana min alaq, created mankind from the clot, the clot of blood, which clings. Ikara, wal rabbukal akram, recite. And your Lord is most generous. It continues and tells us that he is the one, Allah, who gave the human being the knowledge in how to read and write and use the column, the pen. He's the one who taught mankind that which he knew not. Knowledge is one of the facets of Islam and knowledge comes to us from this, from the Qur'an. Peace is a facet of Islam. It comes to us from this, 
from the Quran. So many of the other facets of Islam directly connect to this facet. And that's why I particularly wanted to spend some time talking about the Quran. It comes to us in Arabic language, but it didn't come all at once. It came over a period of 23 years. And when it came, it came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a way that it was, was really pressure on him to receive this, because it's a heavy message, carries a lot of weight. Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not know how to read, nor write. He never learned those two facets of knowledge. But he recited what he heard from the angel Gabriel. And do you know that today it's still recited the same way? And the knowledge contained in this recitation cannot be matched. Not the science, not the miracles, not the style, not the composition, not the poetry that we find. Nothing can touch the Quran in the Arabia, in the Arabic. Before I was Muslim, I heard the Quran recited. I was so amazed. I had to stop and think, what is this that I'm listening to? I asked the person, I said, excuse me, but do you mind? Please, recite that again. Say it again. What were you saying? What are you singing? I don't know what that is. He smiled and he said, this is Quran. He said, Quran. It sounds like that. Amazing, isn't it? And there's no other like it anywhere, any place, any time. The Quran. When I think about the Quran, and I think how it affected my life from the very beginning, I have to laugh <laughs> because of something funny that I did. I was trying to convert a Muslim to become a Christian, but one of my friends he warned me against those Muslims, warned me against that Quran, and he said, whatever you do, be careful, and don't read that book. You know what happened? The one that I was trying to convert, to come to Christianity, he said something amazing to me. He said, I guess I will go to your religion if it's better, better than my religion. I thought I had him. Because I know, you know, that in Islam, <laughs> you have to pray five times a day, you have to fast Ramadan, you have to make Hajj, you have to pray something, it's called zakat or charity. Many things you have to do to be a Muslim. And above all, you have to worship God as one without any partners. You have to do many things, such as respect for prophets, all the prophets, and hold them in high esteem. Many things you have to do. And I was telling him that, hey, you don't have to do anything, anything at all. In my religion, just come on over and say you believe in Jesus, etc., etc., and that's it, and you'll be saved. Much easier. He said, I didn't tell you I would go to your religion if it was easier. I said I would go to it if it's better. And for that, I will need proof. I said, proof? Proof? I thought religion is about faith. He said it is, but it's also about proof in Islam. And we have the proof. I was amazed and I said, hold on a second. You've got proof? He said, yes. What was his proof? What was he talking about? I'm gonna give you some time to think about that. Because we're gonna go to a break right now. And when we come back, we'll continue talking about the Quran this particular facet of Islam. Stay right there, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We're back from our break and I wanna pick up where we left off. We were talking about this facet, the Quran, and we were talking about something that was said to me about a proof, a proof in Islam. I wanted to know what proof is there really can you prove there's a God? My friend was telling me, yes, I can. I said, can you prove that Islam is the right way? He said, yes, of course. I said, okay, I give up. What is your proof? And he said, 
It's the Quran. I said I could have said the same thing about the Bible. He said, that's true. You could have said the same thing about the telephone book, too. But that wouldn't make it true, would it? I said, what do you mean? He said, look, just saying something doesn't mean it's true. The Quran has within it testable evidence and undisputed proof that it can only be from the Rub, the Lord of the worlds. Are you sure? Find out for yourself. He said another proof is that if you want, if you want to know, then it will come to you. I thought, okay, trying to play the mystery game with me. Mm -hmm, sure. He said, well, here you are. And he gave me something very similar to this right here. This is a translation of the Quran to English, which obviously is still not the Quran because Quran is only in the Arabiya in the Arabic language. But at least it gives us some semblance of the idea of what's being said in the Arabic. You have the Arabic on the one side, English on the other. This is what he gave me. And I took it. I held it in my hand. And then I set it down on the table and I looked at it. And I thought about it. And I thought, you know, I was warned. Somebody told me, don't read that book. Whatever you do, don't read that book that comes from those Muslims, that Koran. And that's how they pronounced it, Koran. So I left it laying there. And he said, would you like to read it now? I said, no, no, that's okay. Just, just leave it alone. Later, when there was nobody there, I looked at it again and I thought, okay. And so I said a prayer and I said, oh God, I pray to you and I ask you to protect me Protect me from any evil while I look into this book and see what's in there. Now, right away, I know the Muslims are laughing. They're chuckling. They're saying, <laughs> that's right. That's what you're supposed to do. This is what Muslims do when they recite the Quran. They say, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitani Rajim. I seek refuge with Allah from the condemned devil. Now, why would we do that? Because although it's the Quran, it comes from Allah. Although it is a source of guidance. This is one of the most beautiful things. One of our episodes is talking about this subject of guidance. But still, it can guide or it can misguide. Because that's up to Allah. Just because you read the Quran doesn't mean you're going to be guided. And just because you didn't read it won't mean necessarily that you're misguided. What it means is that you seek refuge with Allah because he's the only one to seek refuge with. And then read it. And without even knowing this, I had done it. Allah had guided me to do the right thing. Allah. And I said, God, protect me from any evil while I read this book. Amazing. Then carefully, I opened it up and I began to read about the Quran because... That's essentially what most of these translations do. They explain to you in the beginning, there's no way to translate the Quran. There's no possible way that you can bring the full meaning from the Arabic to the English. That's not going to happen. But what we're going to try to do is bring you some, some meaning so that you can get the gist of what's being offered. And then I turned to something called Fatiha. And I looked at it. It says, Surah Fatiha. I had no idea what that meant. It means chapter called the opening. And then it began. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. But I only was able to read the English. In the name of God. The most gracious, the most merciful. That's nice. Praise be to God. The cherisher and sustainer of the worlds. It's very lovely. The most gracious, the most merciful, the master, owner on the day of judgment. You only do we worship and only you do we turn to for guidance. Guide us to the straight way, the way of those who have your favor, but not the way of those who have your anger or who go astray. I stopped and I thought about it. I said, that's lovely. 
Let me think about that again. And I wanted to focus particularly on this statement, guide us to the straight way. Guide us to the straight way. I can relate to that. Yeah, I need to be guided the straight way. The straight and narrow, I've heard about that all my life. And guidance, well, sure, I need to be guided. Yes, makes sense to me. The way of those who have the favor of Almighty God. Not the ones who have Allah's anger, his wrath, and certainly not those that are lost. But you know what I did right after that? After I looked at this, thought about it, I closed the book and put it back. Because it came in my mind that, gee, I don't know what I'm getting into here. This sounds pretty, pretty big. Sounds like something that maybe I'm not quite ready for. Let me set that aside. Let me go back to my Bible. Let me look in there and see what I find. I open my Bible and I read. You know what I find in the Bible? I find nice stuff in there. I do. When I read the Psalms, and I think about 23rd Psalms, and it tells me in there about guidance. It tells me in there about God being with me through trials and tribulations and his rod and his staff, they comfort me. And I'm thinking, hold on. This sure sounds familiar. The style, the way that are. Let me check Proverbs. Look in there and read. Ecclesiastes, let me check that out. Hmm. Statements that we have from Jesus in the New Testament. Hmm. Very nice. Then one day I got the courage to just open up. Open up the Quran and take a look. And see what does it say. Just put my finger down and see what does it say here. It says, on this day. Allah says, he has perfected for you your way of life, your religion, and conferred upon you his biggest of favors and has chosen for you to submit to him in full and total submission in peace. How could I have just turned to such a verse? How could that just pop up in front of me like that? And then again, to open it, let me just go to the back somewhere. Let's don't just jump in the middle. Let me go to the back somewhere in here and see what it says and put my finger down again and look what it says. Say to those who reject faith, I don't worship what you worship. Nor will you worship what I worship. I'm not going to worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To be your way, go to it, and to me, my way. To you, your way, and to me, my way. Lakum dinakum waliyadin. Wow. All the time that I used to preach Christianity, I wished that I had had a phrase like this, because there are people who reject faith. When you're trying to tell them there is a God, and they go, oh, Please. Oh, there are many stories we could tell you about the Quran and how it affects the lives of those who read it. But my purpose here today is only to introduce this facet to you and let you read and find for yourself. Explore and pray and ask him, the one who sent down the Quran in the first place, the one who sent down all previous revelation, the one who sent the prophets to all of us. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him for his guidance. And that too will be one of the facets we'll be discussing in these episodes on the facets of Islam. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes reminding you that only Allah guides. And whoever he guides and whoever he opens up the message of this Quran to, they'll be rightly guided. Assalamu alaikum. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, with Facets of Islam. 
In today's episode, I want to talk about something called in Arabic, Quran. Now, in the Quran, we find one of the chapters or surahs called Al-Furqan. It's translated to English as the criterion. And that means something that you could use as a benchmark or measure other things up to it. You can look at this and then decide for yourself. Here we have a standard, a standard of measure. And then you can choose for yourself. You can see, here is the Furqan. And how do you measure up to that? Islam itself is a Furqan. Because the teachings of Islam are very simple. Very easy to pick up on and understand. The facets that we've been talking about in these episodes are all a part of that. So what you could do is to take these teachings and then compare them to other teachers and other teachings and see what are these guys saying? What's their stuff all about? Bring it to Islam and check it out. See for yourself. The Furqan of Islam is many of the aspects that we've been talking about, these facets. For instance, the Quran itself is a Furqan. If you have another book, bring it. And let's compare it to the Quran. Will you find another book that has as many people devoted to it as the Quran? And the answer is no. Will you find another book from some other religion that's still in its pure and pristine form, recited exactly as it came hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago? And the answer is no. Will you find a book that so many people, so many followers are willing to dedicate their life to, to preserve it in their own memories? I was asking the director of this program earlier about the Quran. He said, I love it, I love it so much. And this is the way of all of the Muslims everywhere. We all love it and we all wish that we had it committed to our own memory. Every Muslim has that desire. And consider that. Ask some people in other religions if they have the desire that they would trade any amount of money if they could just have this book of theirs committed to their memory. Hmm. Every single Muslim has this desire to memorize the whole Quran. So this is one of the benchmarks. Compare. And then another benchmark for Quran is the permit peace and blessing be upon him. Now, we don't set him up to be a god, a demigod, nor do we worship him. We do say, peace be upon him, when we mention his name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessing be upon him, we say that. But then, after all, we say that for all the prophets. When we mention Jesus, alayhi salam, Abraham, alayhi salam, Moses, alayhi salam, we say that about them. So, if somebody has a prophet, a concept of a man, a human being, that they would like to compare, let them bring, bring him, and compare, compare to Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. Now, for the one who's Christian, right away, you say, oh, I'll bring Jesus. Well, hold on, before you get too excited, remember that Muhammad, peace be upon him, believes in Jesus. Remember that Muhammad is the one who testified that for sure, Jesus is one of the mighty prophets of Allah and also that he's the miracle birth. He also said that Jesus will be back in the last day. And even some Christians don't believe that. But Muhammad did. He believed in Jesus' miracle birth. He said that he was the word, Kalamatullah, the word of Allah, the Logos, if you know Kone Greek. He said that Jesus did many miracles, including bringing the dead back to life, all by the permission of Almighty God, Allah. He also said that Jesus was the Messiah. And whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, according to the book of John, read the book of John and see that you're not a believer unless you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Therefore, Muhammad must be a believer because he believes he's the Messiah, the chosen one the one to lead the children of Israel to all victory. Some people will say, well, that didn't happen. But they forgot he's coming back. And when he comes back, that's exactly what he's going to do. And we know that from Muhammad, 
peace be upon him. So you can't bring Jesus against Muhammad because Muhammad's for him. You have to bring somebody else. You say, well, what about Moses? And again, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us about Moses. We find it in the Quran, beautiful statements. There's more about Abraham and Moses in the Quran than there is about Muhammad. In fact, listen to this. There are hundreds of statements in the Quran about Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Jesus alone is mentioned 25 times by name and referred to also as the son of Mary, Ibn Maryam. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, is only mentioned four times by Muhammad and once by the name Ahmed. So what we see immediately is if you want to talk about anybody and bring them against Muhammad, you have to know about him and what he said and what he taught. Another furqan in Islam is the belief, the belief that Muslims have about Allah. What do Muslims believe about Allah? Have you ever thought about that? We don't believe that Allah walked on the earth as a man walking around trying to figure out where, where's Adam? Can't find him. That's not our belief. We don't believe that God came down and wrestled all through the night with Jacob and put his leg out of joint, disguised as an angel. That's not our belief. We don't believe that at any time that God ever had any deficiency or that anybody ever wrestled with him or that he ever made any mistakes. In fact, the belief in Islam is that Allah is absolutely pure, absolutely perfect, and he is the epitome of all of his characteristics and there is none like unto him. Check that out because there are others who claim a belief in God. They claim that they believe that there is the Almighty, but yet when they begin to talk about him, compare, compare the belief and see. Is it truly monotheistic or is it something else? One of the statements we've talked about in other episodes is how Muslims would never say that God is everywhere. They won't say that because that would mean he is the creation and Muslims don't say that. In fact, they say that he's never in his creation. He's not a part of his creation, nor is creation part of him. It's a very pure and pristine belief that the Muslims have. This criterion, this furqan of the Muslims has so many aspects of it. Talked about the book, talked about the prophet, talked about the belief in Allah. Consider too, look at the Muslims and the way that Muslims are. True Muslims, when they behave and what they do, if they really live up to Islam itself, it's also good for those in the society who aren't Muslim. They all take benefit from Muslims who practice true Islam. When the Muslim is really following Islam, it's truly an amazing thing. And you can use that as a benchmark as well. Because when the Muslims are paying their zakah, or charity as they're supposed to, you will find that there's nobody around to accept it anymore because there are no poor people left. If the Muslims today would just apply this one aspect of Islam fully, you would find a wonderful society for people to live in. The teaching of Islam is very clear. Humans don't always live up to their teachings, but for sure the teaching is there. The amount that people should give in their zakah, if it were paid across the board, you would find no poor people left on the continent. When you check this benchmark, this criterion, and compare it to so many aspects in Islam, you will be surprised. Not the least of which is one called salvation. What is the plan of salvation? In Islam, does someone else have to die for your sins? Does someone else have to pay the price for you? Or are you held accountable for your own actions? Consider that. Think about that for a minute, because what we want to do now is take a break. We're going to come back and pick up right here with this subject of the benchmark or criterion, the Furqan in Islam, on facets of Islam. Stay right there, we'll be right back. 
Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes with Facets of Islam. We're back from our break and we want to pick up right where we left off. We were talking about the Furqan, the benchmark, the criterion. Now what we want to do is go back and examine that last example I gave you about salvation. Because perhaps this is one of the biggest subjects of Islam. What is salvation in Islam? First and foremost, understand that Islam has taught us about direct connect. This means that I am able to reach my Lord at any time. I do not need to go to a temple or a church or a mosque to be able to pray to my Lord. I don't need to go to a human being. I don't need to have some kind of an idol or an icon to focus on. In fact, all of those things take away from the message of Islam. Because the benchmark here is that your connection with your Lord is direct. And it's from your heart. You don't even have to move your lips. Just feel it in your heart. Just think it. And he knows. Because he's all-knowing. He created you. He created me. He created everything. And he knows what he created. He knows your condition. So when you cry to him, even if you don't cry out loud, he knows the cry. So this connection is the first part of the salvation because then what happens? What happens is that you recognize that you've made a mistake. You've done a sin. You've committed some masi or ithim as it's called in Arabic. And you recognize, oh boy, that was bad. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that thing to that person. I hurt that person. I, I need to repent. I need to stop hurting people. I did this or I did that, something bad. I shouldn't have done it. So I need to just now go into my heart and begin to cry to him and ask him, ask him to accept, accept my repentance because that's the salvation of Islam. There is a chapter in the Quran called repentance in Arabic, and it means to go back, repent back to your Lord. Go back to him and ask him to forgive you. That's pretty simple. It's straightforward. Show me, show me a better way. What would be better? Because you know in your heart when you do it, you've done it. I did it. I asked him. I don't have to be concerned whether or not he got the message. We know he got the message. Now, sometimes you will make some sacrifice. Yes, you may slaughter an animal, but you're not going to do it on a on an altar and offer the fire up to the heavens. And No. When we sacrifice an animal, it means that we slaughter it for the meat to be distributed amongst the poor, the underprivileged, the orphans, our families, and ourselves. It's an act of worship. Not an act of waste, not an act of cruelty to animals. The opposite, actually. And consider this, too. The balance that Islam is offering. Go look at the facet we talked about already. This balance in Islam. And compare that to any other way of life. Where else do you find such a balance that teaches you so many things that really are common sense? The logic, another facet of Islam. The Quran facet of Islam. The facets that we're talking about in these programs, take all of them together and then use that as your benchmark. One God, one message, one way, one brotherhood of prophets, one ummah or brotherhood or nation. Very simple, isn't it? Everything keeps coming back to one, doesn't it? What else can you find that will stack up against these facets that we're talking about? I want to think about the brotherhood. The brotherhood in Islam, that when Muslims really follow that, it becomes so special that a brother in Islam is preferred even over a biological brother simply because this man has the same belief. He has the same concept. And he's also committed in the same way to truth and justice and peace. 
Oh, these are words that people use a lot. You can say it. Go ahead. Use all the words you want. But it's not until you put them into practice that you really see the results of these benchmarks. It happened to me. It happened to a lot of people. That when they saw Muslims really live Islam, they said, I don't have anything to compare to that. The person that I was trying to convert to Christianity actually was saying and doing the things that Jesus had taught. I wasn't. He was. I was thinking, if we make this man a Christian, it won't be long, we'll make him a saint. He could be a saint. He's really an amazing guy. Look what he does. When he gives his word, he keeps it. When he is entrusted with anything, he never breaks the trust. When I did business with him, I watched him time and again. His business habits were impeccable. I couldn't believe that a human being would be so straightforward, so honest. At first, I thought he was doing it for show. I mean, you know, why is anybody going to the trouble to be so meticulously honest and trustworthy? But then when it came to worship, when it was time to worship, he would stop. He would stop his business affairs right then and there. And he would go off. And you would see him praying five times a day. And in the month of Ramadan, he stops eating, drinking. And do you know, all day long, this man is like an angel. He's really sweet, amazing. And when it comes to charity... Well, most of it he kept secret, but I would see from time to time when he was trying to give charity, I would catch it. This man was an amazing person. I never heard him cuss or say a bad word. Nor did I see him smoke or drink any alcohol or do any of the bad things that a lot of people take for granted as though that, hey, modern society, it's okay. He was shy, and if women come around him, you would see him lowering his gaze I asked him about that. I said, what's the matter with you? You act like you're shy. He said, this is Islam. We're not supposed to go up to women shaking their hands, having eye contact, slap them on the back. Hey, how's it going? You know, he said, this is not Islam. This is not the way. You people of the West, you don't, you don't understand. But our way is to be shy and humble, and especially in front of women. We don't do that. I said, really? That's amazing. So when we see a Muslim really live Islam, when we see a Muslim sister wearing her called hijab, her covering, and when we see them going to the mosque and staying there and praying and crying, standing, worshiping, when you see these things, what comes in your mind? When you consider the Catholic Church, the very best of the best of those women, aren't they wearing something like these women wearing Islam? Don't they? have a covering called the habit. And sure, they're praying too, and these are holy people. We recognize that, don't we? So likewise, let us consider the role of the Muslim women and how is that really supposed to be? Because look what we see. We immediately see that these women in Islam, they're not cut off. As with the nuns of the Catholic Church, they can't ever get married, you know that. In fact, they told me that they're married to God. This is not the case. This is not the case. Islam are supposed to get married. They're encouraged to get married and have children and raise them up to also be good, righteous, and holy women. The same for the preachers and teachers in Islam. That they should also do that. And that is to be married and have children. Not cut themselves off. Go ahead and measure it up. Look at the other religions. Look at the other philosophies. Look at the other societies. Take what they have and look at it. Compare it to these facets. These facets that we've been presenting here in our series on facets of Islam. Do it and see what you think. I have no doubt in my mind that if you're sincere and you open your mind and you open your heart and you really look to these facets to these for a con, these benchmarks that you're going to come to the same conclusion that I came to. But listen to this. 
the real deal, a real impact on me came. When I was said this and that and so and so, he was very polite, kind, easy with me. And then he said to me, now it's no longer a subject between you and I. I said, huh? He said, there's no need for any more discussion, you and I. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you see, you have already discussed and said yourself that you agree there's only one God. You have said that it's impossible that Jesus could be God and man at the same time. You said that you accept that Muhammad must be some kind of a prophet because he confirmed the truth of what you find in your Bible. I said, well, yeah. He said, no, there's no need of me to say anything else. You need to go and you need to talk to your Lord. I said, what? He said, that's right. Because we don't believe we can guide people. That's another criterion in Islam. That's a furqan in Islam. We don't think that we guide people. We believe that Allah guides them. Or he lets them stay astray according to what's in their hearts. So you go ahead. Go talk to your Lord. I was shocked. How is that? That's not much of a salesman, is it? Shouldn't he be trying to convince me? Shouldn't he be trying to get me to sign on the dotted line here? No. No. Go talk to your Lord. Go ahead. Take your time. You need an hour, a day, a week, a year, ten years. Take your time. Because it's not about you and me. It's not about you and anybody else. It's about you and your Lord. And when you really understand that and you really ask him, Lord, guide me. Then you'll find the real Fakan. You'll find the real benchmark you'll find the guidance that only comes from the Lord of the worlds. And that, to me, is one of the most important of all the facets of Islam. Until next time, may Allah guide you. Assalamu alaikum.